Caleb. Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. Welcome to everybody who is uh, visiting. Welcome to you if you're looking for a church. We're a Bible preaching and Bible believing church. So open up to the book of Hebrews where we will be walking through the word of God to us this morning. Uh, Before I do, of course, uh, we are celebrating baptism after today's service before uh, the second morning service, which we praise God for. If you have believed upon Jesus Christ, if you would call yourself a Christian, you believe you're saved and you're going to heaven, or at least you think and hope that that is true about you, if you've been converted and since you've been saved, you have not been baptized, the Lord's command in the scriptures is that you should be water baptized to show forth and to proclaim that you are belonging to Jesus and that you have been washed by his blood and that you have received the promises that he makes for us in the gospel. So some maybe you're a, a, a young adult and you've been in a Christian family but haven't made that step of baptism, though you would call yourself a Christian uh, because there wasn't, I guess, maybe an entire lifestyle change for you. Well, God's call on you is to be baptized. Maybe you have been converted or brought to the Lord Jesus Christ from outside of the church and you had maybe religious upbringings or maybe nothing of the sort. God's mysterious yet uh, physical command for us is enter the waters of baptism, celebrate with the church in that salvation that Jesus has accomplished for you. And one of the elders, uh, your Bible study leader, if you're attending a midweek study, or one of the deacons would be glad, would love to sit down with you and explain uh, the scriptures teaching on baptism so that you can do this with, a, with an informed mind and an uh, informed conscience. We would love that. Uh, I will just, by way of announcements, also remind you... Uh, t- uh, To be here tonight, of course, because uh, we meet twice. We have different sermons, different services. It is uh, the Lord's day, we remind ourselves. The Lord's day, not the Lord's morning. And so we meet twice on a Sunday to to, uh, uh, ready ourselves for the new week in service to Jesus and to uh, hear the Word of God twice on the whole day that He's given to us. But also tonight, we're going to be praying over a team that uh, I will be joining, but a team that will be going up to North Queensland uh, later on this week, and our aim and goal is we're partnering with the local church and our aim and goal is to see multiple suburbs entirely uh, 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 obliterated is what word is coming to my mind. That's not the word I'm thinking. I'm not James and John praying this down upon unrepentant cities. Uh, Permeated is what I'm going for. Thank you uh, for your patience. With gospel literature, so handing out gospel tracts into letterboxes as well as going to Cairns uh, during schoolies week this Saturday. Pray for us, please. And we will be handing out, I've been to Gold Coast schoolies. I don't know what regional Queensland schoolies is like. I'm wearing a headgear and a cup and shin pads. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, these farmer boys are going to come out in, in uh, force. But we're going to be uh, tracting and preaching the gospel, doing some open air sermons. So we're going to be praying over that team tonight. We pray that you would come here and be with us as the uh, team readies themselves for that gospel service for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Without further ado, let us look to the book of Hebrews. The the main theme of Hebrews, or the main command, if there is a command, is do not drift. Do not uh, uh, shrink back or fall back or be backslidden in your your ever-degrading, downgrading uh, 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 fervency and zeal and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The receivers of the first sermon, which this book was turned into a letter from, and the recipients of the letter were those who attempted for some reason or other to shrink back from their all-consuming, entire life giving, all-absorbing faith in and zeal for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he is known, confessed, and explicitly worshipped in the church. They wanted to to shrink away from that out of self-preservation. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, do not neglect this eternal salvation because it is given to us from heaven in and through an eternal Savior, and that is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is the main theme of Hebrews. That is our main theme this morning is Jesus Christ. So if you've never heard of him, we are glad you are here to hear about the Savior from heaven, Jesus Christ. If you've heard about him but are unfamiliar with him, we are thankful that you're here today. May God bless you with a, with a richer understanding of Jesus Christ. If you know much about him but have rejected him, then today is the day that God would have you bend your knee, shut your mouth, and confess in your heart that Jesus is Lord and your only possible Savior. And if you have believed upon Jesus, and this is a time 
of adoration and inspiration as we look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, and see what the writer of the Hebrews would say about him to us. So chapter two, we're going to be taking basically in three parts. We've already been in it uh, 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 last week as well, but we're going to break up the remaining study into three parts. This week from verse five to nine, next uh, week from verse 10 to 18, and the week following, the conclusion in this chapter is really at the beginning, and so we will go back and study chapter two, verse one to four. This morning, we're going to be reading from verse five down to verse nine. And the thematic verse for this entire chapter or this entire sort of paragraph argument that the writer of the Hebrews makes is actually given to us in conclusion form in verse 17. So we will read chapter 2, verse 5 through 9, and then verse 17. Hear now the words of the one true living God. It is not, in fact, to angels that God has subjected that world to come of which we are speaking. It has been written somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Here comes the explanation of the Old Testament verse. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing out of his control. Now, at present, we do not see everything in subjection to us or to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. We see him crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Verse 17, therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in Every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. May God bless this word to us and to his glory this morning. The theme verse is there in verse 17. Jesus had to be made like us in every way, manner, and respect so that he could qualify to be a faithful, meaning he finishes the job, and a merciful, meaning he's patient with us, high priest in the service of God. That is, today's understanding of of chapter 2 is really focusing in on the fact that Jesus has entered into our human status. Next week, verses 10 to 18, we will look at how Jesus entered into our human nature, Flesh, blood, temptation, weakness, death. But today we're looking at how Jesus has entered into our human status. That Jesus is truly, absolutely, and fully human. And you would be forgiven if at this point of listening to the sermons through Hebrew, if you are experiencing a little bit of spiritual whiplash. It kind of feels like the person who was in charge of the transitions between chapter one and chapter two was Jason Statham or Vin Diesel, and we're just going at breakneck speed, 100 miles, down, uh, 100 miles an hour down the highway. Jesus is God, chapter one told us. Jesus is of the essence of the Father. He is eternally tri- uh, 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 God within the triune Godhead. He is God the Son, eternal, infinite in his being and perfections, eternal, timeless, immortal, glorious. He is the uh, the radiance of the Father's glory. He is the exact copy of his nature. Jesus is God. And then he whips on the handbrake, buries his foot onto the pedal, locks the wheel out, slides across the the, the highway, and then slams his foot on the accelerator, going, going in the opposite direction, saying, not that Jesus is not God, but that Jesus is man. He is fully man. He is truly man. He he exhausts the fullness of everything it is to be human. He has entered rightly, wholly, and fully into that experience of the human status that God has allotted to us. This is our consideration this morning. That Jesus, who is God, is also like us in every respect. The fullness of God dwelt bodily in Jesus 
so that it can be said of the God we worship as transcendent, immortal, above us, sovereign. We can say about that God, he is like us in every respect. In the 11th century, there was a uh, theologian who asked the question about what, what Christians throughout history basically summarize this teaching of Jesus being God and Jesus being man, and what word could we come up with to sort of explain this, this what theologians had called a hypostatic union, that is a personal union in, of two natures. And, and basically the shorthand that Christians came up with, you'll love this, it's simple, guys like me can understand it, and I played a lot of rugby in my teenage years, it's simply this, Jesus is the God-man. Easy. It's got a hyphen in there, so it's two words. It doesn't uh, 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 shake us too much. That's how we do it. How is, how, what word do we use? That Jesus is God, and Jesus is man. He's the God man. That's, that's pretty much where we leave it. And Anselm had uh, been asking this question against some of the, the heresies or misunderstandings or confusions in his day in the church. And he wrote this book in mostly question and answer essay form. And the book is called Cur Deus Homo in the Latin, meaning why the God, man. Literally, why God, man? Why did God become man? Why the God, man? And his answer for that perplexing question, which every human has to answer, every person has to under, uh, understand or at least come to grips with this. I hope that you ask this question. If you've uh, become familiar with the gospel of Jesus, would you just put the brakes on your flowing motion of spirituality and ask yourself, slam the brakes hard enough that your head hits the steering wheel and you're an old 1980s Holden, so no airbags. You slam your face on that steering wheel and ask yourself, what have I been doing? This is a question of the ages. Have I never really de de dove into this wonderful consideration? Why did God become man? How wonderful and glorious is this consideration and shame on us any time that we have allowed it to become lukewarm to us. We have to think about this. And if you've never really thought about it before and you're not a Christian, then this is the tremendous question to ask and answer today. Why in the world do Christians believe and would, would uh, they historically teach that God became man? And this is the answer that Anselm gave. He basically argued that since it is by man's sin that man is condemned, well, it must be by man's righteousness that man is saved. He goes on to argue that since it is the human death which enslaves and consumes mankind for our sin, therefore it must be human death that is experienced by the Savior. He argues very logically and scripturally that since it is an innumerable mass of people that need righteousness, you and me, Therefore, the righteous one must be of infinite value. He must be of higher value than just one mere human. Otherwise, his righteousness would really only count on the value scales of God's righteousness to be equal for one human. He must have infinite value. And since it is for innumerable souls, which must be delivered from death in the Savior's death, then that Savior must have the power of life in and of himself to grant life to so many others. And since it is humanity, he argues, that is estranged from God, and since it is God that is estranged from humanity, the saviour and mediator who comes to represent both parties in the mediation and salvation, he must truly represent both parties and therefore be natural to both sides. To represent God, he must be God, and to represent man, he must be man. So the saviour of all God's uh, people, the saviour of sinners must be man. And the Savior of God's people must be God. Welcome to the mystery of the revelation of God in flesh. Jesus, the God-man. That's our consideration this morning. To be our Redeemer, verse 17 tells us, to make propitiation for sins, or in a broadly speaking thematic way, as he sort of summarizes the whole of the book of Hebrews, to be our merciful and faithful, merciful to us, faithful to God, to be our merciful and faithful high priest who makes a sacrifice for sins, brings us into God's presence and becomes for us the heavenly temple where we experience God's love, grace, forgiveness and atonement. For him to do that, he must be like us in every respect, chapter 2 says. The early creed, the Nicene Creed of the Christian faith, summarized it like this. 
It's speaking about Jesus as God and then Jesus as man. He says he's of the same essence as the Father, through whom all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and he was made human. This is what we're talking about this morning. This is what we need to wrap our minds around as much as we can until our expanses and our full limits just explode and slip from our grips. And we need to kneel beneath the glory of this truth. God, the full essence of God, the Son of God, for us and for our salvation, became in every respect like us. So look at verse five, or look at verse six of chapter two of the book of Hebrews. He's going to quote, and and we will go to Psalm 8. So you can see in verse 6 there, he says, For it has been testified somewhere, and he quotes Psalm 8. So you can actually uh, turn with me to Psalm 8 so that we can see it in its own original wording and context. But this is the argument. Psalm 8 is a psalm all about, you would think, and it is, all about human beings in our status beneath God as our Lord and beneath God as rulers over the earth. It's a, it's a psalm about what it means to be made in the image of God. It's a psalm about the wonderful privileges and honors that God has bestowed upon the human race made in his image. It's a, it's a psalm about humanity. And here's the argument from the book of Hebrews today. Jesus has so much become one of us in every respect that you can pick up an Old Testament psalm about humans and it is still about Jesus because he's truly one of us. This isn't primarily, as you read it, one of the psalms that you read and say, this has to be about a saviour to come. I mean, it says things like being God and reigning. It's not like Psalm 45 or Psalm 102, which chapter 1 used in the book of Hebrews, to argue for Jesus being God. It's not one of those psalms that you read and go, this has to be about God or at least about a God figure. No, this is just a psalm that sounds very human and is very human. And the argument is in Hebrews, Jesus so became one of us that you can pick up an Old Testament psalm about humans and apply it to Jesus. Just like in chapter 1, we use the psalms about God and applied it to Jesus. You can make Psalm 8 about Jesus as well. So let's look at Psalm 8, which is quoted in chapter 2 of Hebrews. And here we see Jesus stepping into our human status. So the psalm reads like this, O Lord, our God, or O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It's going to finish that way as well. Tremendous bookends. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of your mouth, babies and infants, you have, uh, out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moons and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you spare a thought of us and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. Or as Hebrews quotes it and gives us a right interpretation, you have for a little while made him lower than angels, the heavenly beings. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep, all oxen, and also the the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen, someone. Now you read that and you understand Uh, that it kind of reads like, and if we have a full understanding given to us from the New Testament, I I, I don't know if they still have these in high school, but I remember when we were learning biology, we had some of those transparently printed pages in biology books. You familiar with what I'm talking about? Uh, The first page lies down of the human body, and you have the skeleton. And then you you flip the next uh, see-through page onto that, and and it sort of lays out on top the, the nervous system. And then you might turn the next page and you can still see the ones underneath, the bones, the nervous system, but now also the circulatory system. And then you turn and you place upon it the flesh and the sinew and the muscles. And then the, next, uh, pay, the, the last page places upon it and really finishes off the human uh, uh, being by, by putting skin upon it. 
And so depending what page you've, uh, what layer you've put down is depending what degree or what kind of a, 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 a way and manner you are studying the human body. And Psalm 8 reads like that. On the first layer, Psalm 8 is really reading as if it is talking about mankind in the garden when there was only two of us, Adam and Eve, and primarily Adam, the great representative of us all. It kind of reads like it's just talking about Adam. And then you turn a couple of pages and you realize, but it can also be talking about us in the fall, can it? And then you turn another couple of pages and you realize it's actually talking about Jesus. And then you put the last layer upon it and you see that it's actually talking about us again in our redeemed and glorified state. So look to Psalm 8 as we unfold some of these layers. Of course, it opens up that God is powerful and majestic and, and it really focuses upon his merciful power and blessing to give to humankind who, if we think about it, in the Garden of Eden, in our original created state, before the fall and before sin, he has given to those who, even though we're sinless, we didn't deserve honor. God bestowed upon it it upon us by grace. As created beings, God owed us nothing. He could have made us as worms, but he made us as those in his image. He made us with an immortal soul. He made us with capacity and capability of doing glorious things. And so unfallen in the Garden of Eden, and some of you need to understand this, maybe for the first time, that that the world as we see it today, the world as we study it, either on a sociological, anthropological, or even biological level, is not the way that God had first created and intended it to be. We see degradation, death, and destruction We see sin, evil, and suffering. I'm sure you can point to things in your own life. And it is not that God has made the world like this and smiled upon it and said, this is great. This is exactly what I want. I want suffering and death and war and blood and horror. God, first of all, perfectly and uprightly made the whole world free of sin and therefore free of the curse, free of suffering, absolutely uh, 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 sharing with him in that blessedness of peace. In the Garden of Eden, all was perfect. Then Adam was given dominion, and that dominion was perfect and efficient. His lawn looked exactly the way he wanted it to look. No lawn grubs, husbands. No weeds popping up that he was not able to easily pull out. His work was perfectly productive. The the, the ground, we need to picture kind of almost, almost biology working differently before the fall. That in the Garden of Eden, the the ground itself yearned to bless its Lord, its its King, Adam. That the ground itself would delight to bring forth fruit and agriculture and plants to the will and the behest of Adam. The the, the, the animals as well, as Psalm 8 says, dominion over all things, sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, and all of those enormous things we've never discovered along the deep paths and trenches and ruts of the seabed. All things answered to Adam's voice. He could stand upon, he had no fishing line, he had no need of that kind of uh, uh, entrapment. He simply could stand on the side of the sea and call animals to himself and they would come. He, he had no uh, enmity or danger between him and bulls or kangaroos or whatever it is in your country, elephants, lions, snakes, nothing bit at him. Nothing was a danger to him. He was a blessed, peaceful, ruling king as God had made him on the earth. And he experienced the wonder of that peace between him and nature, him and animals, and him and God. And so Psalm 8 speaks of that wonderful experience. That even as I describe it now, it sounds Sounds kind of like sci-fi. You sound like I'm sort of extrapolating into nonsensical speculation because that can't really have been what any human experienced on this earth, but it's kind of right to feel that way. It is so alien to our experience to, to feel and experience the world in that way because we are so far beneath and so many generations in to the world being cursed after Adam's sin. But this is what it was like for Adam. So, as verse 7 in Psalm 8 says, all things were under him. As verse 6 said, he was given dominion over the work of God's hands, and all things were under his feet. That is the language of subjection. He never had to break a sweat to eat or provide for his wife. He was in perfect peace with the world and in perfect dominion over it. In that unfallen state, he was, as verse uh, 
uh, 5 says, just beneath the angels in terms of glory, he was crowned with glory and honor. In that sense, Hebrews 2.8 comments on this psalm and says, Now in putting everything in subjection to him, God left nothing outside of his control. Adam was truly God's representative on earth, and he truly had this lordship relationship with the world that would not be miraculous, it would be the created order. And yet if we were to really have a moment of just watching Adam in the garden of the most ultimate better homes and gardens uh, uh, experience, we would think it looks miraculous. It looks supernatural what he's doing because the world we know is so cursed. So Hebrews 2 tells us, in terms of our original creation, Psalm 8 is right. God did put everything in subjection to him, to us, to humanity, and he left, left nothing outside of his control. But then the next layer that we can pick up and, and lay down upon Hebrews 8 of interpretation to understand is the next layer of the fall. The fall of man, when Adam was tempted uh, through the words of his wife, but ultimately the teaching of Satan, who came in kind of an angelic, reptilian, serpentine form into the garden, and who spoke to them and tempted them to break the law of God, to question the authority of God, and to compete with the glory of God. And they gave in, they agreed, they ate the forbidden fruit, and God turned up seeking them and condemned Satan for his lies and condemned Adam and Eve and all humanity with them for their sin. So that's where you and I are now under the curse of this world because God cursed every relationship that Adam had. His relationship to angels was now ruptured and they would not answer to him. His relationship with Satan was now broken and he was under the influence of Satan. His relationship with the ground was now twisted and the ground would push forth thorns to punish him. And the ground, Romans 8 tells us, shakes in earthquakes, natural disasters, storms and tornadoes in this groaning effect, regretting and wishing that Adam had never sinned because it now feels the, the labor-like throes of pain and cramps waiting for the new creation. The world now kills us in its natural form and the animals do the same. Unleashed upon the earth was the contagion of bacteria and viruses. Who knows what their purpose was before the fall? Now they seek to destroy, burrow, kill, and, and, and slay us. Who used to rule over them? Men upon the seas and women upon the oceans in boats and are swallowed up by the, the glorious majesty but terrible power of the oceans and its mysterious creatures. Our relationship also with wife was cursed. There would be enmity almost between husband and wife and there was enmity ultimately between God and man because man was now condemned and man was under God's just wrath. For sin, all of us in Adam and Adam as humanity and humanity's representative was cursed. And therefore, we look at Hebrews 8 and we see that it's not really telling an honest story. We read verse 5, you have crowned him with glory and honor. We say, no, we are crowned with shame and death. See, the ver beginning of verse 5, you have made him for a little while lower than the angels. Wrong. He has now condemned us to be eternally judged far beneath the glory of the angels, never to receive or enjoy the glory that the angels experience. Verse 6 says, you have given him dominion over the work of your hands and put all things under his feet. Wrong. We are called to exercise dominion, but that is an uphill battle going up Mount Everest. All things are against us. Not one of us exercises lordship like Adam did and like we could have. All sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, talk to your farmer. Do they obey you at the simple uttering of a syllable of your voice? Do they come running and give birth at your decree? Do they uh, 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 serve you? As obedient servants, I mean, if you have a cat or a dog, you know, especially a cat, you know how Satan has infested the, uh, uh, the natural world. The birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea. No, you need tricky little lures with shiny things on them that twist around that cost way too much at BCF to try and get just one bass under your hook. The fish do not obey us, nor do the mighty animals in the paths of the sea. So the fall makes this book out this chapter out, this psalm out, to be wrong. 
And you know what? Hebrews 2, verse 8, actually kind of agrees with that interpretation. Hebrews 2, verse 8 says about this, at present, we do not see everything in subjection to him or to us, to humanity. We don't see it. We don't see the world in subjection to him as we've just described. So it seems to me that we have three options. Option number one, this psalm has no application anymore. It was only about Adam in the garden. But since it was written by David thousands of years later and preserved for us in Scripture, and it seems very presently applicable to David who wrote it, I don't think that option should be taken. Option number two, the psalm is wrong. It is the blabbering of an ancient sheep herding made king idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Option number two, for obvious reasons, is wrong. Here's option number three. Psalm 8 is true not only of Adam in the garden. Psalm 8 is true in anticipation. That is, it is true not of something we presently see in the world. It is true of something that will come later and it therefore demands that somebody comes and makes it true again. That, my friends, is how the writer of the Hebrews uses Psalm chapter 8. Psalm 8 is true of Adam in the garden, but it is also true of a future state, and in order for that to be true, a second Adam needs to come along in order to turn the third layer upon this psalm and show us the full way that it is fleshed out in Jesus Christ. Jesus is that third phase, that third page of understanding. And in that sense, Hebrews 2.9 then says that though we don't see all things in subjection to us at present, yet, verse 9, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. In other words, he's telling you this. If you, need to re- if you want to read Psalm 8 with actual truth and applicability, then you need to read Jesus into Psalm 8 because without Jesus, Psalm 8 doesn't make sense. God's word about us doesn't make sense without Jesus becoming like us. If I could say it this way, mankind's destiny always required the sending of God the Son to be like us. Our destiny and Jesus' salvation was always intertwined. And so look at how we see Christ in Psalm 8. If Psalm 8 is true of us, Follow the logic of the book of Hebrews. This is the whole reason he goes to Psalm 8. If Psalm 8 is true of us as humans, then it must be true of Jesus because he is truly a human. If there's any human experience or human status or or, or human psalm in the Old Testament, which Jesus, doing his morning devotions in Judea, as he's reading through the Old Testament, if there's any chapter about humans that he reads and says, I can't really relate to that. This is not really my vibe. That's not the kind of humanity I have become. I don't experience that. I don't enter into that. I do not relate to that in any respect. If Jesus ever thought that, then we have no saviour because we don't have a saviour like us and we need one like us. So the writer of the Hebrews is saying, Psalm 8 is so much about us that it has to be true about Jesus because he is one of us. But if it's true about Jesus, then we can say some glorious things about Psalm 8. We can look at our nature in Psalm 8 and say that Jesus experienced that also because Hebrews 2 tells us he became like you and like me in every respect. Are we made lower than the angels? And so the Son of God who made the angels humbled himself to be for a little time on his earthly ministry lower in glory than the angels. Are we weak? So Jesus became weak. Are we mortal? So Jesus became mortal and able to die. Are we under the weight of God's law? So Jesus was born and lived every moment of his life under the obligation that God's law put upon him. Are we afflicted with pain and misery in this cursed world? So also Jesus lived With pain and misery, the only unfallen, perfect human to ever experience pain and misery fully and accurately without the tainting of sin. It is Jesus who suffered the most in his life and in his death on the cross. Are we cursed under God's wrath? So Jesus bore the curse of God's wrath on the cross so that he might be like us in every respect. 
That's his humiliation. But it speaks also this psalm of his exaltation. Does Psalm 8 verse 5 speak about our being made and crowned with glory and honor? Yes, it does. So then Jesus as human was resurrected and crowned with glory and honor on the throne of God. That's what crowning means. He was made king at God's right hand. Were we meant to have all things subject to us so that at the speaking of our command, things would obey and nature would bend to our will? Yes, we were. Then, therefore, all things are now subject to Jesus under his sovereign feet. He must enter into the status and the experience that humans were made for. And so he has. And so <laughs> Psalm 8 closes very fittingly. Oh, Lord, our Lord. Oh, Yahweh, Son of God, Jesus, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And Psalm 2 verse 9, apply, sorry, Hebrews 2, let's go back to Hebrews. Hebrews 2 verse 9 gives us the fitting closing uh, 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 interpretation and application of this psalm. It says, it was about us, but we've lost that. Not all things are subject to us. But now all, we do see Jesus who is crowned, We see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor honor because of the suffering of death. That is to say that he earned his glorious status as eternal king of the earth, the new head of all humanity, through the obedience and death of his cross. What Hebrews 2 verse 9 calls the suffering of death. He was truly human. He couldn't merely waltz into death with a robe on, uh, pretending that the wounds hurt him. He learned how how humans cry when he saw uh, other men crucified throughout his earthly life in Judea. So he he sort of imbibed that and learned how to to cry and and how to pretend like he's really being hurt. And then he entered into death in this painless experience of simply passing into the shadows and then he stepped back out from stage left in some kind of quasi-resurrection. Jesus' death was a real human death experienced by a perfect unfallen mind and therefore the greatest degree of suffering that any human has ever suffered. Worse than those who are presently in the fires of Hades and hell was Jesus on the cross. Here's Siri stepping up again. Didn't ask you, woman. Turning you off. Get behind me, Satan. She's not sure what I'm talking about. Jesus' death was a suffering death. It was a true human death. It was an experience of death that touched every nerve and every spiritual faculty and every mental capacity of his humanity. His death filled every cup of his existence with suffering and gore and horror. And he suffered as a human into death so that he could be glorified in our glory with honor and a crown. Psalm 8, therefore, here's the conclusion of all of that. Psalm 8 concludes, Jesus was made like you in your status in every respect. Jesus was made like me, like sinners, in every respect. And here's the what for. Here's the why as we close. He, if he is like us, If he is like us, and this is the closing logic of verse 9 of Hebrews 2, if Jesus was meant to be like us, and so he was sent and he became like us, and so he went through all of those phases of his life in order to uh, relate to us and represent us and enter into our existence, our status, and our storyline that God has placed for us, if we can look at Jesus and say he's just like us, he's entered into our experience and our story, then we can look at Jesus right now and say that we will be like him. Because he is not as he is now, crowned with glory and honor, with all things subject to his feet, angels around him, and the heavenly world uh, uh, basking in his glory. He's not like that because he's God. He had that already before his incarnation. He's like that now, verse 9 just told us, because he came down, was lower than angels, and suffered death. That means... Jesus' glory and honor and resurrection and indestructibility and awaiting the new world to be created around him and for him, that is right to his human status. Therefore, we can look at it and say, that's what humans have waiting for us. If he became like us, then we will be like he now is. He is our representative. So what we were, he became 
But as our representative, that means that what he is, we will become. Not God, not second person of the Trinity. There are no vacancies in that triune Godhead. But touching his humanity in resurrection, glory, and power, and subjecting all things to him, we will be kings with him again. He became like us in every respect so that we might be like him in every respect. This is the fourth layer of the Psalm 8 biology book, the fourth and final layer. So not only was it about Adam in the garden, and not only does it have something to say about us in the fall, not only is it true of Jesus, but as humanity's representative, let's put flesh on it. It's about humanity in the future. He became like us in every respect so that we can become like he now is in every respect, touching his humanity. Is he above death? So will we be. Is he untouched by disease? So will we be. Is he ruling victorious? So will we. Is he indestructible in his resurrection life? So will we be. Did he taste death and then spit it out again, flushing it down the sink? Then so will we. The experience of death for us will be but a drop on the tongue and then we will explode into resurrected, glorious, heavenly life awaiting the the world to come that Jesus will make. Death for us is but a drop because it has been tasted in its fullness by Jesus. Verse 9 therefore says, look at verse 9 as we conclude. It says, so that by the grace of God, all of this, Becoming like us, experiencing our status, living the fullness of the human experience was so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. If it is true that he has become like us, then you get to look at his death and say that his death was for me. His death and resurrection means that I can hold fast and believe in and look forward to and anticipate A deathless death. If he has tasted death and he's representing us and he represented me and he tasted my death, I need not die. I have died when I believed upon him. I died, I may not look like it, maybe you think I do. I died 2,000 years ago and I haven't rotted a day since. I died 2,000 years ago on the cross of Jesus Christ at Calvary because there he tasted death for me as my representative. Just as I could tell you that, that up thousands of years ago, I sinned in the garden because there my representative stood with my name on his badge and he sinned in my place. So also I can say I died 2,000 years ago for that sin in Jesus Christ on the cross. I resurrected 2,000 years ago in the body of Jesus Christ and I was ascended with him, Ephesians tells me, and I'm seated with him in the heavenly places waiting for that final day when what is true of him is true of us and you and me, that all things are made subject to us again and then we will cry out, O Lord, O God, O Yahweh, O Jesus, how majestic is your name in all the new heavens and earth. That's what we're awaiting. The great dragon, the great giant who barred eternal life for us, who stood in front of the gates of eternal life and did not let you pass, that great dragon and giant is dead. His head is split open upon the cross. He is dead. Jesus has gone through. The doors are open and therefore now one representing you is saying, come to me. Come into eternal life. Leave behind your death, leave behind your sin, leave behind the hell, leave behind the curse, leave behind your condemnation. Leave behind your old self and your old heart and come to me in eternal life. For he has gone where we could not go, but he went there for you and for me. If you've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, but you are a human, then you have a representative in heaven calling you to himself. If you have been unfaithful towards God, sinful and rebellious, good news, Jesus was faithful for you. He's a faithful high priest to God. If you are weak and needy and in all of your sins, you need mercy, good news. The one who stands beyond the grave, who tasted death for you, who is crowned with glory and honor, Jesus, your representative, is merciful. He's a merciful high priest and calls you to himself and will never reprimand sin if it is placed upon his shoulders. Come to Jesus today if you've not ever before. Believe upon him, trust in him, and rejoice in the good news of salvation. For those who believe, let us now worship Jesus Christ for all of his glory. Father God, we thank you.
Words cannot describe the wonder and the glory that you have bestowed upon us. And this would have been true even just with Adam in the garden. Even then it would have been right and appropriate to say that you blessed us beyond what we deserved. You were merciful and kind and gracious, simply pouring out blessing upon blessing that was never earned by us in some kind of pre-created state. You made us from dust and you made us kings of the earth. You gave us the wonders of the animal kingdom beneath our feet and the glories of nature at our fingertips. Lord God, even if we just spoke of Genesis 1 and 2, there would be reason to say that you are majestic, you are kind, you are gracious to us. And yet, Lord God, our case is infinitely worse than merely made of dust. Because after the fall, we are made of sin. And we have rebelled against you committed crimes against your law and despised our very creator who blessed us so highly in the first place. Yet, Lord God, now your mercy, your grace, your true heart, your, your, your willingness to justify and pardon sinners is now put on full display because yet being your enemies, being so far lost, being so far disregarding of your law, yet even from them, you can crown us with glory and honor and you can forgive us. You can give us mercy and grace and pardon for our iniquity. You can resurrect us, bring us back to you through the experience of death, and all of this makes sense only because of Jesus' wonderful grace, obedience, and perfection in our place. Father God, we look to no other help. We look to no other savior. We look away from ourselves. We think only of Jesus and how he saves us. Father, forgive us of our low, short, blasphemous thoughts of Jesus as a mere helper of those who help themselves and help us to realize that he is God, eternal God, become true man for us and for our salvation. Would you, by your own divine, kingly authority, Lord Jesus, command those who do not yet believe in you to be born again by your Holy Spirit and to place their faith in you as their savior. We pray all of these things in your wonderful and majestic name. And everybody said, amen. amen.